Today we're putting two of the best lights in the industry head to head. The RE Sky Panel and the KinoFlow Select 30. You ready for this? Recently here at Vistac, we've been doing a couple productions where we've got a chance to use these two lights. And if you haven't seen our Fujinon review of the MK18-55 to lens, where we use these lights quite a bit, you can see it with a link that I'll put in the description below. Um, but what I want to do is give you guys a sense of what these two lights share as far as what they have in common and kind of where they differ. Um, there's not a lot of content online, funny enough, that compares these two lights, although that's a bit strange because they're so similar in what they do and they're the two most dominant brands in the film and television business when it comes to lighting. So you'd think that there'd be a lot more content. Now why is that? Well, number one is they're f***ing expensive. This guy's $5,600 Canadian and this one right here is $3,700 Canadian. So why on earth would you spend this kind of money? Well, you probably won't or maybe you won't. Um, if you're a rental company or if you're a studio system, you're going to buy a ton of these. Um, but if you're an independent producer, probably not, but you might buy one of these. But either way, you're probably going to run into them a lot if you are shooting a lot of film and television because they're a huge rental item or they're going to be a big rental item. Um, and you're going to see them a lot on bigger sets especially. And as the technology improves and the price comes down, you're going to see this kind of technology exists a lot more. So it's good to know when you run into these guys on set and you're gonna see a lot more of them, why you would pick one over the other. And I hope to give you a sense of that today. So let's go to the sky panel first. Why would you buy an RE sky panel? Well, there's a number of reasons. One is if you are a rental facility, if you are a large film production company that uh, is gonna be using lights like this a lot, it does make sense to make the investment. RE builds these lights like they build all of their products, which means they're built like a tank. They're built to last. So it can go in a truck, out of a truck, a million times from Sunday, and it's probably not going to fall apart. Can't say the same thing for a lot of other LED lights on the market. Um, the other thing is, not just externally is it built well, but internally, um, the light is essentially a very advanced computer system. And through the USB port here, uh, we can talk to Ari effectively. So if there's any sort of weird shenanigans or monsters in the machine, if you will, that happen with the light, it can uh, take an error report push it out to a USB card um, or a USB dongle, and then you can send that error report to Ari's uh, technicians and they will be able to troubleshoot the light for you. Another great thing about this product here and about the USB dongle um, accessory is that if you have 10, 40, however many multiples of this light on set and you want them all to respond similarly, you just need to program one light, save those settings, onto the USB key uh, and then just simply plug that USB key in or upload those settings to each light. So it's a huge time saver when you're trying to turn over on set and do different lighting effects uh, and make that happen across the board. So where you're gonna see this light in play a lot more is on bigger productions um, where you just need a huge amount of light and a lot of control over the light. There's uh, three different ways to remotely or hardwire control the light through uh, DMX um, and through this thing called ArtNet as well. Uh, so as far as like the most advanced light on the market in terms of tunability and controllability, uh, it's hard to beat this. And so when you look at that price point, it kind of makes sense because the amount of research and development that Ari has put into this light uh, is kind of why it costs as much as it does. Uh, and uh, did I mention it's built like a tank, right? So let's go into the settings really quick. I want to give you a sense of uh, how easy this light is to use. Along the display, you have three major dials. This is your adjustment dial here. Then you also have uh, these two dials. One selects obviously the color temperature and the other one selects the plus or minus green. This is the intensity dial, so we're going to dial up the intensity. And you'll notice that if I take it slow, uh, it's quite graduated in the dimming up. But if you are freaking out and in a hurry, just a quick spin and through the speed of the rotation uh, brings that uh, dimming up quickly. And then you can see as well that we have our full color temperature dimming. Again, if you go slowly, you can do it quite incrementally. It goes all the way up to 10,000 and all the way down to 2800. Now there are three different modes. So we've got our HSI mode, so it's our hue, saturation, and intensity mode. And this is based on your hue angle and your saturation. 
So I can go anywhere along the hue angle and choose from 360 all the way down to red, and then I can pull down that saturation. Then I can toggle through to the uh, gel mode, and the gel mode is really cool because what it allows you to do now is you got a choice between Roscoe and Lee. And then there's submenus, so that's your main menu, choosing between two brands. And then within that, you've got their different lines. So the Cosmetics 600 series, and the Color Filter series, and Color Correction. And so if I would just go, I think it's probably going to be in the 600 series, and I've got Industry Sodium, um, High Sodium, Urban Sodium, uh, low sodium, so we've got all sorts of delicious sodium to add to your film meal. Um, and then platinum, moonlight white, uh, blah, 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 so and so forth. So you can match basically to wherever your surroundings are. Let's uh, bust into the menu system here. We've got our DMX settings here, but we can also toggle down to our fan mode if you want your fan to sort of be a bit quieter, uh, if you want to dissipate heat more and the, the volume of the, the fans aren't as much of an issue, you can do that through here. Uh, light mode, uh, you can select the same thing that the mode up here does, but now it's just through the menu system. Um, you can do it if you want to do it through there. Uh, I can go into light control and this is going to allow me to change my dimming curve. So I can have my dimming curve be fairly linear um, or I can change it where it sort of ramps in different parts of the light curve uh, and it gives you quite a few options to be able to do that in here. Uh, the dimming curve, if I select it, you're going to see things like linear, uh, exp exponential, um, logarithmic and S-curve. So a bunch of different choices that you can sort of play with. Um, if we back out of here, let's just keep it at linear. Another really cool feature to like control is the special modes. So uh, low end mode, uh, low end mode allows you to operate the light at very, very low levels. Um, so just kind of a light, light glow because the, the RE uh, sky panel is a very powerful light and so you might not need all the light that it pushes out. And so uh, with this light, uh, you can uh, operate at low power without any change in the CRI um, of the light itself, but you have to select that low end mode to be able to do that. But a really cool feature here is the tungsten mode. And the tungsten mode, what it does is as you dim the light, it changes its color temperature just like a tungsten source would. So really matching a lot of your practicals on set, you can just dial it in to the actual color temperature, 3200 degrees Kelvin, um, and then when you dim your actual practicals down, when you dim this down, it's just going to match those automatically, or it's just going to be able to replicate that even if this is off uh, screen, um, so to speak. Uh, so let's back it out again, and let's just look at some of the final things. And we've got lighting effects. Basically, they have a party mode uh, here, which makes no sense why anybody would use it, um, but because it just does this, it just cycles through the hue curve. Um, I guess if you're having an actual party, it seems like a bit of an expensive party light. Uh, because if I was going to use this in a music video or for some sort of weird effect, uh, I would rather control it a little bit more myself or use a DMX board, a DMX controller, um, or a mobile app or something like that. Um, because this is just sort of, it's like canned party, right? So. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's there. So uh, if you ever want a party mode, um, and let's back out into the menu again. Uh, display setup USB function. So here we go with the USB function. We've got uh, the light presets, fixture settings, and save error log. So this is where you're going to be able to interact with that USB uh, port and to be able to use a USB dongle um, through all this. So if you get an error, you can save it to the error log, send that to Ari's technicians, and they're going to walk you through how to repair that. Um, and then we've got uh, the ArtNet settings which is one of the ways you can communicate hardwired through the LAN port with the light itself. Um, and uh, then some general fixture settings and the factory reset. When I first encountered this light and turned it on and started going through the menu, I was a little intimidated. Um, I expected it to be super complex and so it seemed complex to me, but after spending even just like a few dedicated minutes with it, it actually is quite simple um, and it is laid out really, really well and it's a tribute to Ari's ability to research and develop and to think through uh, how 
people need to be able to use this light quickly and easily um, at high pressure, fast paced sets. So that's uh, this guy. Uh, we've also got a bunch of different ports here in addition to the USB. We've got our uh, DMX in and outs. We have our hardwire LAN uh, there for our ArtNet. Then we've got our power. So here we've got our 48 volt DC coming out of our ballast right here. And then we can operate off of a V-mount battery with uh, this um, DC here. And I think like a 28 volt uh, V-mount is a great product to be able to put into put into there to run this light uh, remotely. So uh, the only other thing is this light, uh, there's a couple of the features with it. Obviously you just get a tilt function and a pan function with this light, um, but there is no ability to roll the light. So um, it's sort of just square and square is where it's at. With the sky panel, you do get a couple cool things. Um, you have a little latch at the top, and with that latch at the top, you can then pull out um, the diffusion. And there's a bunch of different types of diffusion. You've got standard, light, and heavy um, that change the uh, obviously the light output. Um, and with uh, this, you can also buy a intensifier, and the intensifier uh, actually boosts light output considerably. Um, it seems to be about uh, 10 to 20 percent lumen increase with the intensifier. It's like little like focusing beams uh, and they just slide right in. But what I really like about this is it's just not chintzy, you know, like it's pretty solid just like uh, everything Ari does. So it just slides in and then locks down. So what always really impresses me about any RE product is just how well engineered and how well built they are. Okay, so now moving on to the Kino Flow, and we're gonna look at our user interface in the back here. You can see that as soon as you plug in the lamp and it's not officially on, that the display still comes up. And this is really useful that if you've got a rehearsal with actors going on on set and you need to make some tweaks before you strike the lamp, you can do all of that. I can adjust all my dimming and Kelvin and any of the light hue modifiers without actually striking the lamp. Um, so we're gonna just set that back down to zero and we're gonna turn it on. Um, so what we have now is we have a dial that works a little bit differently than the sky panel. This one is got a fine tuning as well, but the speed doesn't change anything. What I have to do is have to click it and now it goes by every uh, five percentile points. And uh, we've got our Kelvin and that can be just modeled over by hitting the mode and going into our green and magenta channels to change that as we need to. Um, the thing that's a bit different here is that while the sky panel allows you to change your modes within the first screen, with the select you have to go into the menu to change those modes. Um, so I go into menu, now I can go into my general and with this mode I can switch it between white, gel and hue, and RGB. So let's go gel hue for example. And let's get out of there. And then now, we got our dim, Kelvin, that stays the same. But now with our mode button, we can toggle through. And I can go through all of our different proprietary gel numbers here. You can see there is just a wealth, pretty much everything that you need. Will it match your Roscoe or Lee? I don't know. You can probably get it close, um, but these are, to my understanding, proprietary. Um, then we can also just toggle to our hue, and we can, again, just dial whatever color we want, and bust it over to our saturation. Let's crank up that saturation. And again, we can, there we go. And we have everything we need. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, digging deeper into there, we'll go in the general, and then we can go RGB. This is another cool feature, so then let's get out of here into there, and we can go into our mode. We can select, you know, all green, so let's make that nice and cyan, right? There we go. So that's a really great feature that the sky panel doesn't have. So let's go back into the general setting. We've got a couple things here, timeout uh, and smooth on. I didn't research what these are. I have no idea what they are. Maybe it's important. Screen allows you to switch the screen from upside down. Uh, so depending on where you've placed your ballast or how you've oriented your ballast. Um, 
That's pretty useful, I think. Um, then going back here, we've got the reset. And under reset, um, this is where you um, can clear your presets, but also where the demo mode is. This is basically what they call, this, this is basically their party mode. Um, they're just a little bit more honest about it uh, in terms of like what it's actually going to be used for because I don't think realistically anybody is going to use this for a production of any type. It's really just when you want to try to sell it in a store effectively. At least they're honest about it. Um, so we are going to now get out of our demo mode here and go back. And then we've got our DMX and uh, we've got dim curves as well. We've got square and linear. Um, and we've got our DMX wireless stuff, uh, as you would expect. So um, pretty much everything that you get with this guy, um, except for sort of that uh, USB functionality that allows you to bus over all your features. Um, and as well, um, you don't also have the, um, the ability to deal with any sort of error messages and then communicating uh, in the same way that you can communicate with Ari through that USB dongle. Uh, one of the things that I really love about this, which is kind of native to the whole concept of KinoFlow, is their lightweight design. So if I'm going to mount this guy onto a menace arm, I want to be able to remove as much weight from it as possible. And so one of the great ways to be able to do that um, is to pull the ballast off of the fixture itself. And you're gonna to wanna to do this as well because there's no way for you to be able to change these settings uh, when the ballast lives on top of the fixture if you've got it way up high in a menace arm. So this allows you to just tie a little bit of sash to it and maybe hang it directly right onto the, the lamp here. Probably can't see it there, but I can just kinda of hang it uh, as I want to wherever, or I can place it as far away from the device as I want to place it. Um, the other uh, advantage too is that we can kind of rig this light up wherever we want to be able to rig it um, through the classic Kino Flow uh, lollipop system. So just a latch, just like you found there, and huzzah. See, I caught it. You thought I was going to drop it, didn't you? Oh, I, I know what I'm doing. Uh, and then what you're going to do again is you can take this guy off and pop it in, just like the Kino Flow four bank selects. Bam, it's on and then onto your baby pin, like so. The other great feature with this guy too is that with the lollipop system, I can orient this light any direction that I want, vertical, horizontal, straight up, straight down. I can do all of this, which is uh, really fantastic. So KinoFlow is really great for being on location um, because you can get this lamp source in really, really tight sp spaces. Um, you can almost tape it to the ceiling. I would not do that, but Almost, you can get a sense of like how light it can get um, with the chloroplast. Uh, so that's a pretty cool feature. Um, and then we're gonna just put the ballast right back onto the fixture itself and it sits snugly in those little holes there. And pop the Velcro loop in and away we go to the races. Let's quickly talk about some of the connectivity with it. So on this side we have our DMX controls, our DMX in and out. We as well have our DCI in, uh, 18 to 36 volts. So again, another 28 volt uh, V-mount battery is great choice for powering this lamp. Um, moving over to this side, we have our uh, toggle button here, our intensifier button. We also have um, a lock on the AC cable going in, which is great. So if I want to pull it, I actually have to pull the little red switch and give it a tug. Um, and then pop it back in and it clicks into place. So there's no worry about it pulling out. But here's the greatest feature of all. If you've lit with Kino Flows ever, even once, we all share the ability to commiserate with their head cables. They have these plasticky head cables that always break and so you can never really secure them. You just kind of have to like push them in and then Hope nobody trips on them or pulls them out. Uh, they've solved that problem with their new head cables. So they've got these uh, sort of multi-pin circular head cable here um, insert, but it's got a sheath that is aluminum uh, and it snaps into place. So it's no longer a plastic uh, sort of uh, multi sort of twist. It's just a kind of quick, quick small twist in. So I just line up the head here and 
with a sort of half turn, it locks into place. This is something that I see as being way more durable and way less frustrating um, to, uh, to play with basically on set. So uh, kudos to KinoFlow for doing that. I've also heard that they have built up uh, a more robust uh, cable in here. There's now three cables inside instead of a, just one dodgy little copper one. So your Coroplast uh, housing is going to last a lot longer as well, which is great. Um, and that's functionally the KinoFlow LED Select, a, a, a really great light and great value value for what it gives you. So here's some final thoughts on where these two lights will live within sort of the production sphere. Let's first talk about value. We can break the price of these lights down to the price or the dollar value per lumen. And in Canadian dollars, that's $8.44 per lumen. So a pretty economical price per amount of output it has when you look at it over its $5,600 list value. When we go over to the Kino, we look at uh, its price overall being a lot lower, but the lumen is about $12 per lumen. So the value isn't as great with this one when we're just measuring it against light uh, output. Um, but the Kino does serve a niche that that one doesn't serve. And so for smaller productions, this still kind of makes more sense, even though uh, the way we interpret value and light intensity may not really play out as much in the real world. Um, when we look at light modifiers for both of these guys, they both have their own set of uh, in, um, proprietary and aftermarket light modifiers, so like soft boxes, chimeras, uh, all those sorts of things you can buy for all these guys, uh, including barn doors, and as we saw with this, you have uh, the intensifier and different uh, diffusion as well. Um, and that's pretty much it. I would have to say that like, you know, the average person is not going to be dropping $5,600 on a light panel or a few light panels. Um, this is really the realm of the rental house, but if you work full time in the film business, whether you are a DP, a gaffer, or an electrician, um, or you run a video production business, uh, you're going to be running into these guys a lot more, especially as prices go down and the technology becomes more ubiquitous. All that about sums it up. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you got something from this. And please subscribe to our channel because there's a whole lot more videos like this coming your way, as well as we've got a great Instagram and Facebook account, so find us online. And please comment in the comment section below. We'd love to hear from you. What kind of video do you want to see? Share your stories, share your opinions, even the trolls, even the trolls. That's all for now. The only thing left to do is have a little party.